Palooza. So thank you all for coming out on a, another lovely fall evening. Um, not quite as summery as Monday's opening of uh, the event, but it's lovely out there. Uh, lots of new faces, and that's great to see. Thank you very much. It's been a, a very uh, busy four days. Uh, we've had our consultants in town working hard, and we've seen many of you throughout the last couple days over across the street from Town Hall. Um, and I would like to just say a quick thank you to Cindy Taylor, who's here tonight, who enabled us to use this space. Very, very generous. Thank you very much. Um, so very briefly, I'm Jay Chase. I'm the planning director here in town, for those of you that haven't yet had a chance to meet. Um, and we are here, uh, by way of brief background, to update our comprehensive plan. And as part of that process, we have brought in a consultant team, and I'll introduce you to Sandrine, who's going to really be walking us through a presentation this evening uh, to help us with that process. And part of that is this Manapalooza public engagement activity um, where we've spent a lot of time getting your feedback, hearing what the direction uh, you want to see our community go, and uh, Sandrine and her team have started to put that in and tonight are going to reflect back for us the direction that they're hearing and we want to be sure that as the plan gets written up and comes back to us later this winter for us to talk about again and think about again that we're starting in the right direction. So without further ado, here's Sandrine and her team. So much, Jay. Um, thank you, Cindy and Dee, for uh, letting us use your space. It was wonderful to be so close to coffee <laughs> all week. It was great. Uh, and thank you all for, one, being here tonight, but also for all of you who participated earlier this week. Uh, we've had such great turnout at the studio uh, during the last few days. We were actually pretty impressed. There are some communities we work in, and, and people don't, don't use the open studio time to come visit with us, but uh, we've had... Um, we, we guessed about 50 or so people actually came in just doing open studio. That's aside from all the meetings that we've had and all the other events. So it was wonderful to hear from all of you. So thank you so much for taking the time to be here also tonight. Um, so we had a kickoff uh, back in May. Uh, town staff had a series of meetings through the summer. And then we've been working here for the past three, four days uh, with you hearing your feedback, your input. Uh, we don't have all the answers yet, so you'll hear a few things tonight. We're still going to be doing much more work. Uh, we can't find all the answers in a couple of days, but we are excited to you know, present a few things um, tonight for your reactions, make sure we're um, working along the right tracks uh, and all of that. So tonight will be a little bit of a tag team. I'll get, I'll get us started, and then Brian and, and Matt will jump in and uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, a few other aspects as well. So. Um, so here we go. And then we definitely want to have a conversation with you guys um, later on also. So we actually started the week by looking at a, a little bit of some, some of the history and some historic maps that you have and understand how the town has developed over time. And that really helps us when we're thinking about the future uh, also. So um, especially Brian is kind of our history um, nerd. Can I say that? <laughs> he loves those history, those uh, history maps. So we've, we've been looking at that and having a great time um, doing it. And I just want to uh, retouch on a little bit of the, the data and sort of the basic of who is Scarborough. We talked about that a little bit Monday, so it might be a repeat for those of you. Who was here Monday night? Who was not here Monday night? Maybe that's, oh, a lot of great new faces. Awesome. Thanks for Glad you're coming. So we'll, that will be a little bit of a repeat, but we're just going to run through a few things here. Just a few highlights of what we've learned about Scarborough. Um, so your population is aging. For one thing, this graph on the slide shows uh, a percentage of increase in these different age categories from 2000 to 2010. So you can see that the older age categories are increasing much faster than, than some others. And your median age is um, has increased during that 10 year span. So, uh, so, and we've heard a lot this week about seniors and the, the, you know, the, the need to be able to keep and house seniors here, people who have lived in town all their lives who might want to downsize their homes need to have a place to, to do so and move um, elsewhere in, within the community, within Scarborough. Uh, 
you've also um, added more people in the community between 2000 and 2010 than any uh, other communities in the state, actually. So you've been, uh, in that 10-year span, you've grown faster than, than most communities around the state. You have very low unemployment rate compared to the state. I mean, the state is already pretty low, but you guys are, are even lower than that with 3% of unemployment. Your income levels are in the upper tiers as far as communities in the region here, in the metro regions. So you're doing well on that end. You've added uh, about 2,000 jobs here in Scarborough in the last 10 years. That's remarkable. Um, that's, a, that's a high amount. I believe that was, you are added more jobs in Scarborough in the last 10 years than any other communities in the region. Did I get that right, Karen? Yes. Great, thank you. <laughs> and you're the seventh largest uh, community in terms of the amount of jobs, and that's statewide. Um, so you have a lot of great uh, jobs here. And your largest sector is healthcare. I'm sure that's not a surprise to most of you. Uh, in terms of housing, uh, looking at that pie chart that you see there, that shows that 77% um, of your housing is single family detached housing. And there's another percentage, about 6% is actually um, single family attached. So about 84% or so of your housing stock is single family homes. Um, so adding a little bit to the diversity of housing, we've talked about that a lot this week, uh, might help with um, just offering more choices for, for different populations that you might want to attract or keep here in the community. Um, affordability has been decreasing over time. Uh, you know, if you consider your median income of about $77,000 um, a year for a household, uh, and, and remembering we presented another information that median uh, prices of homes that are selling these days is about three hundred and sixty nine thousand uh, dollars That actually leaves a gap of almost fifty thousand uh, dollars That someone who earns the median income cannot afford to, to buy a house here They're sort of missing fifty thousand dollars of revenue to be able to do so and to be able to afford that uh, We've heard also a lot this week about um, young professionals We've had people coming in who you know talked about their daughters, sons who are teachers, firefighters, who work here in the community but cannot actually afford to live here. Uh, it would be wonderful if you could house your teachers here in town, but uh, with the income that they make at the starting salary level, they unfortunately cannot afford to live um, in Scarborough. And, um, and again, the, the, the seniors and the retirees and people who might want to downsize, who might live in a big four-bedroom home and all the kids have gone to college or you know, have moved away, uh, who are looking to downsize. We've also heard that there's not a lot of choices, uh, affordable choices for, for seniors or retirees who might want to downsize and stay within um, Scarborough here. So a few um, solutions to that, and we'll be looking into that much, much further as well, is uh, you know, looking at the size of units that are created. Um, you know, reducing the size of units that you create also means increasing affordability. The prices will go down a little bit. Um, ha having some affordability requirements within your regulations in town, there's already some of that in your current zoning regulations, but looking into into doing something like that a little bit more um, could also help with that. And really diversifying the types of, of housing um, that are offered here. You know, these days there's uh, a lot of folks are within, you know, this whole tiny house movement. Uh, I don't know if you have, do you have any of those in, in Scarborough yet? No? <laughs> I'm sorry, I had the back up. Um, you know, but, but making sure that these types of housing are, are available, that uh, accessory dwelling units, sort of units uh, either above a garage uh, and on someone's property, things like that, are great ways to provide some affordable housing uh, for people who might need it. So just making sure that there's a mix of offerings so that there are choices for everyone who might want to, um, to move here or stay here. Uh, uh, so this is another interesting um, chart that we showed, uh, which is the, the last 10 years of residential development permits. So the peak that you see there was actually uh, back in 2000, and uh, after that, I, I can't remember, the, what was the year exactly that the, the cap was instituted? I'm looking at Karen or Jay. 2001. It was right after that. 
um, so the, the residential, uh, the amount of residential permits has been uh, increasing since the late 1990s, uh, but it's, it's coming back up a little bit. Um, and this is, uh, this shows, uh, this is also a great, um, great piece of data. This really shows that in the, this circle here is, are, is the number of people who actually live and work in Scarborough. So only 1,600 people actually live and work here. Uh, 7,000 people or so uh, live in Scarborough but work elsewhere. And we even we looked a little bit further at the data this week, and um, most of these people living leaving Scarborough to go work elsewhere are actually going north, so Portland, South Portland. Uh, there are other places as well, but for the most part, that's where they're going. And then there's 12,000 or so people who live elsewhere, all throughout the state, actually. The, the region is pretty wide and actually come here to Scarborough um, to, to work every day. So think about the amount of commuting and knowing that most of all of you uh, drive alone in your car when you're commuting to work. Uh, that's quite a bit of cars on the road um, that create that congestion of traffic, or that can be at least one element that uh, that play that. So, um, so these are the maps that um, for those of you who were here on Monday night, or for those of you who came to visit us at the studio uh, over the last few days, uh, this is a composite of all the maps that you guys worked on with all the, the colored dots. Uh, so we just wanted to show that, and you know, it's easy to, to start to find and see areas. This is Oak Hill, this is Scarborough Downs, you have Dunstan here, this is North Scarborough. Uh, so it's easy to start identifying areas of the community where people either thought there were great opportunities for something to happen there, or uh, really a need for, for improvement. Um, so just a few of those areas. Uh, you know, Eight Corners was also another area that people identified as really needing either change or a place where um, there were great opportunities for something to happen in the future. So some of the big ideas that came out, of course the, the list is much longer than that, but some of the things we've heard this week, uh, that of course, you know, first and foremost, protecting the marsh, we've heard that this is really a central key of the character of, of Scarborough. And you guys, you know, really want to protect that. Make sure you're you're keeping um, keeping that and other natural resources, of course. Making sure that water quality and all that is is preserved and protected. Um, a community center. Who does not want a community center? Anyone? Because I think we've heard that from every person we've talked to this week. So it's something that's a re that's a huge need uh, here. So for sure, uh, that would be something great to to do. And we'll we'll get some, give some thoughts to that. Um, we also heard take control of Scarborough Downs. You know, I think it was on Monday night that some, it was a, a few tables actually suggested that the town should purchase Scarborough Downs so that you all as a community have power over decision making and what, what happens there. And, and we've heard, of course, a lot of people wanted to um, see sort of a new town center happening there. So that was an interesting concept that uh, we've heard again and again, not just on Monday night, but also from new people who came to the studio during the week. Uh, traffic, of course, on Route 1 and throughout the community at various intersections is something you all deal with on a regular basis that you're all hoping we, uh, we look into and we will. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so increasing road network uh, within the community will help alleviate some of that traffic. And of course, housing and affordability is also something came back a lot uh, this week that we've heard uh, time again. Um, so we zoomed in, for those of you again who were here at this video, we kind of zoomed in and zoomed the Oak Hill area. Uh, so just a few um, opportunities or things that were mentioned also, uh, people thought that that could actually be a location for a new community center since it's already a municipal campus. Um, <clears throat> Just connecting the municipal campus to Scarborough Downs, is, if anything was to happen there, it's so close together, just making sure that it's all well connected. Uh, improving walkability, uh, you know, providing more, more connections for cars also to potentially relieve a little bit of the traffic at that main intersection of 114 and Route 1. Connecting uh, neighborhoods, 
you know, and just adding a little bit more density in this area, creating a more of a mix of uses and, and bringing more walkability. Uh, a lot of people thought that that could actually become more of a town center where the community gathers. I think you already do because of the park that's there, but it could uh, change a little bit and be uh, improved on, on some of those points. And then we also looked at Dunstan. Uh, and they're also, you know, creating more of a village center, more of a village atmosphere, uh, and then improving a lot on, again, on transportation. So, um, on increasing walkability and um, street connectivity, which will also potentially help with uh, relieving some of the traffic on the major intersections there. So this was all wonderful feedback that we heard from all of you all week. Uh, and from what we heard at the project kickoff back in May, everything we've heard from all of you during the, the summer meetings, so those of you who participated in that, and everything we've heard this week. What we did also this week for all of you is to start to craft guiding principles. So think about those as uh, value statements or goals that the community has. So we've we've been hearing you, and we've uh, so we wanted to present those uh, to you tonight. These are still going to be refined in the next several weeks as we continue to sort of digest all of the information that we have. Uh, but we wanted to, to present those tonight. I'm not going to necessarily read them all, but uh, the concept of being a welcoming community uh, to really ensure that the quality of life for all residents by providing a livable um, Community and uh, you know great neighborhoods where neighbors can um, just create a sort of a, a neighborhood life uh, together. So stewardship that get, that speaks to protecting your natural environment and conserving and safeguarding the marsh and other natural resources uh, that you have here in town, and also managing the town resources wisely for future generation. Make sure you do not. Only thinking of a French word right now. <laughs> then you're not jeopardy, jeopardizing, um, you know, the future uh, the, of the town for future communities. So authentic also is about capturing a sense of place and really creating that sense of community again and that community identity that is unique to Scarborough. A lot of people talked about the marsh that really makes Scarborough very unique that people love so much. Um, so these are all elements that make this place um, special. And so continuing to embrace that and, and really create a place that, you know, that, are, that is unique to, to all of you and to your community. Uh, connected speaks to the need for a complete transportation system that accommodates all modes of transportation, not just sort of the car-centric, but let's think about pedestrians as well, or cyclists, or, you know, let's think about some transit, if, if that's possible. Um, so it's uh, offering, you know, strong linkages between various areas and various neighborhoods of the community so you can get around without necessarily always having to get in your car. Although we all drive, but uh, just making sure that that happens. Um, a healthy is, a, is about uh, Maintaining a healthy communities, uh, have, you know, you have wonderful parks and beaches and natural and open space areas and trails and all that. We've heard people value that a lot, um, so we need to make sure that we um, continue to to offer that and, and um, provide an inviting and connected systems of of these great amenities that you already have. Vibrance is about. Continuing to build on this economic vibrancy that you have, you know, what I just mentioned earlier, you guys have a great amount of wonderful businesses here, you create a lot of jobs, so making sure that you continue to do that um, as a community and while providing also the infrastructure uh, that is necessary to do so. Fiscally sustainable, uh, you know, we know that you've gone through three rounds of uh, voting on your budgets this past year, so uh, I think it's it's on everyone's mind and uh, I think everyone is committed to um, to being fiscally responsible and making sure that um, you know, you're minim minimizing the impacts and the costs on, on taxpayer as, as a community as you continue to develop, build new infrastructure and so on. And then engage, that's a, we have a lot of them, huh? Um, as I'm wanting to know. <laughs> 
Um, Engage is all about cultivating a community and civic responsibilities, and, and all of you being here embody this uh, tonight. So thank you for, uh, for doing that and being involved in, in deciding and determining what the future of, of your town is going to be. And then the last one is be bold. Take power over your future. And I think by all of you being here again is a sign that you're willing to do that. Uh, but really it's about taking proactive steps to plan the future of your community. And you know, I think we thought of this hearing everyone who was talking about maybe the town should buy Scarborough and Downs. That would be being bold and really sort of taking taking on your future and really deciding for yourselves what it's going to be instead of letting others decide for you. So this is what this is this is about. So um, we'll run quickly about uh, on a few of the um, few of the topics that we that we discussed this week. We talked a lot about uh, resiliency uh, and resiliency for us is relates to infrastructure, to the natural environment, also to economic development. It's just being prepared for the future. And um, just a few things here that we wanted to point out. So protection of your natural resources. This is a great photo here. So this is the marsh that comes right, right here. And um, you've got propane tanks really close, right next to the marsh here. Um, also, you know, the vegetation, sort of a lawn, so returning to more of a natural ecosystem and letting a little bit more natural landscaping would give a little bit more of a buffer uh, to the marsh. And also just moving these propane tanks away a little bit. You imagine if there's a, there's a big storm event that comes, what will happen to those storage tanks, to those propane tanks, they'll just be floating away. Um, so that's, that would help reduce your risk a little bit and be potentially better prepared. Um, and, and, you know, construction also right next to some of those woodlands or, or the marsh or different areas. So having a little bit more of a buffer would really help alleviate um, some, of the, some of your risk and help protect those, those resources also. Um, on the transportation side of things, this is, I mean, you, we all know where this is. This is Route 1. This is on, uh, at high tide. Um, so, uh, again, in, in, if, a, if a big storm was coming or, or if there's flooding, a lot of the, the routes that you have in town could be just completely blocked by flooding, which would ena not enable um, evacuations to happen. So, looking into potentially raising some of those major roads that are evacuation routes, uh, you know, could be a great way to, again, reduce your risk a little bit. Resizing culverts can also help with that in certain cases. Um, and in terms of economic development, uh, people are look like they're having fun, but I'm not sure <laughs> that on this photo this is uh, sort of what we all want. So locating, making sure that new businesses that are coming into town are located um, in areas of low risk, so that uh, you know, in case of again, you're well prepared in case something happens whatever it might be, a storm or any type of, of flooding, you don't have uh, those impacts. And, and um, make, ensuring that businesses are located in a low-risk area, really, uh, we've, we were looking at the SETCO, actually your economic development um, organization has different goals for themselves, and by doing that, you would also help meet uh, the, goal, the, goal that, the goals that SETCO already has, um, such as just promoting good environmental practices and so on. So on transportation, we've also um, obviously looked at transportation. You, we've heard a lot uh, about traffic and the need for more walkability uh, in town and all that. So what we did here, this is actually a map that shows um, only the roads and the streets in town that you have that connect to something else, to, well, to another road, I should say, that connect to another area. Uh, and we kind of removed everything else. So there's about 20 or so roads only that connect. And we know that by creating and adding to a network of streets and having more options to take when you're going somewhere um, really helps alleviate traffic. Right now you're really sort of dumping a lot of the traffic on, on these main roads that are connected to one another. Um, so adding some network connections, and we were just playing around a little bit, 
um, could begin to offer more options uh, like that to help alleviate a little bit of the traffic. Uh, our um, engineer on the team was also um, looking into adding another interchange from the turnpike that could help again with that connectivity, would be adding another access to the network. Uh, and also working with uh, the state DOT to try to uh, perhaps reducing tolls or eliminating the tolls on the turnpike or some rendition of that to really um, bring the turnpike uh, so that the turnpike is your throughway. You know, we know that today uh, Route 1 is, is being used by people commuting from one place to the other. They're not using Route 1 to come to Scarborough necessarily. Some are. Uh, and you guys are all using Route 1 too, but a lot of people are just coming in and going through and not stopping here at all. So um, changing the dynamic a little bit and sending those folks on the turnpike and trying to make Route 1 a road that is being used when people are coming to a destination in Scarborough rather than just um, coming through the, the community. Um, so we'll show a few, a few of the things here and I know that there's a Route 1 corridor study that's, that's going to be um, starting soon. I'm looking at Angela in the back. Um, but we, we played a little bit around. So one, uh, one of the major intersections you all know that we've heard about this week, this is Oak Hill. So this is Route 1 here, this is uh, Black Point Road. So you all know this, right? The queue here, we heard that this, if you're coming up Black Point Road, trying to turn left on Route 1, that that is um, an, an issue. Uh, so we played around a little bit and uh, looked at some options. So I'm gonna play this, this is actually a video. So this is the existing conditions of the queue on Black Point Road. And as you can see here, all the cars are lined up. There's only one learn, uh, left turn lane right now. And at some point, it gets so backed up that cars wanting to come into the true lane or the right, the right turn lane are not even able to come through, right? Because they're stuck because so many people are trying to turn left on, um, on Route 1. So what if we change that? And what if we do a simple restriping of the intersection to create two left turning lanes and either one true lane and, and right turn or there's a few options but this is just showing um, two left turn lanes and then the, the right hand side lane is a true lane with a right turn also. Let's see what happens. If we do that, see how the queue is only up to here or so because all of a sudden you've got two lanes for people to queue uh, for the left turn and because you have two lanes on the route one you can have the double left turn you have the room for that and all of a sudden, all of a sudden you've alleviated this long um, line of traffic trying to uh, so so these are this is just one options of many uh, that could help if we just uh, we're having a little bit of fun to try to see what can happen if that was changed. So this is same volume of traffic, the two options. Um, it's kind of neat to see. So. <laughs> um, and so I mentioned earlier, we've heard a lot about walkability this week. Uh, people especially closer to Oak Hill and Dunstan and sort of the village areas. Um, many of you thought that we, that we can increase walkability, provide more sidewalks and all that. So I think this is a great example of a, of a beautiful neighborhood. It sounds like, looks like the marsh is right there. It looks like people are looking out that way, uh, which is wonderful. And to increase walkability, this is a pretty wide street, and there's no sidewalk, there's no street trees. Um, I can imagine cars going a little fast on here, um, so it might not be as inviting for the pedestrian for people to walk there. Um, so these, you know, this is just one example of a street. Well, if the street looked like this, with sidewalks and street trees that, and a green buffer that really creates separations between the, the, the driving lane and the sidewalk, from a pedestrian perspective, it feels much more comfortable walking here than uh, on the other example of the streets that I showed you. 
Uh, and we're not suggesting putting sidewalks everywhere. You know, you guys have such a big, large geography here. It doesn't. Uh, it, it most likely doesn't make sense, but it, within the core areas, that's certainly feasible. And we'll be, you know, providing you with ideas for more rural roads and how you can improve walkability and bikeability on, on some of those as well. Um, and again, in the core, this this is Oak Hill, right? This is right in front of Town Hall. That was right across the street, actually, from the studio where we were above Scarborough grounds all week. Uh, and if you see these cute little ladies. Um, crossing, but if you look at the crossing signal, it looks like they ran out of time and they better run because they're going to get hit. Uh, so again, just if you're wanting to improve walkability within the within some of the core areas, thinking about you know, pedestrian signals and making sure that there's enough time for that so that they can safely cross would be great. Uh, this is another great, this is actually right on the Black Point Road, also close to Oak Hill. So um, this young gentleman uh, doesn't feel like this is enough of a, of a shoulder to actually ride uh, on the road. <laughs> so he's riding on the sidewalk, which is probably a good idea. It's probably much safer for him to do so. Uh, but we'll be looking at also uh, sort of the, your, your road network and what kinds of improvements we can to, to create safer opportunities and things we and we've actually had a great conversation on, on Tuesday during the technical meetings uh, about some options and some ideas you know wider shoulders with a rumble strip which really is kind of a low cost well the, the rumble strip is a low cost improvement anyway but that could create more of a buffer and a little bit more uh, space for for safer areas for bike and pets. Um, so we'll give you some more options like that too. This is another great example too. This is Route 1. You all know where that is also. If you look, I mean there is a sidewalk, but it, it kind of dead ends over here. So our traffic engineer was actually walking. Uh, he took his slightness on hands by doing this, but he actually walked uh, along here. And um, you know he said that that was not comfortable at all. I'm sure you all know if you've tried it. Um, cars are going quite fast. And um, without the lack of sidewalks, that's that's pretty difficult. Although you do have a, a white shoulder there, but um, so I think I'm done. I'm going to turn it over to Matt, and Matt is going to uh, talk to us a little bit about the conservation and growth map and the work that he's done, uh, which is kind of a, a joint effort. Uh, he's been working on return on investment analysis, so he'll tell you a little bit more about that. all for coming. It's been a great week. It's good to see most of you again. Thank you for hearing us and we'll have a great discussion as we move forward. Um, as Sandrine has kind of started presenting, uh, everything that's going on in this community is influencing this plan, this comprehensive plan. It's things we need to think about. And almost by mandate, it's a time and an opportunity for you as a community to think about everything at one time. This whole push-pull relationship and the effects that it has, you can start to make some of those decisions. But as you're making these decisions and doing these studies, what you'll also notice is that some of the things that St. Drain's already presented on, like transportation, or resiliency, or housing, or natural systems, or other things like that, all have additional studies and reports and things and partnerships that uh, are executed in order to get to an implementable uh, idea or solution. This comprehensive plan is your one opportunity, it's the one place that your future land use map, your growth and conservation, your conservation and growth map lives. It is the one document that everything else is going to look to. It's like, how is it that this community decided it wanted to grow in the future so that all things can try to sync up with this and complement as you go forward. So this is why I think this comprehensive plan is so important, is really what we're getting into now is this one chance, this one time where they really set this document and the tone for the communities to move forward from the land use perspective. So, the first thing we did was recognize that we're not starting from scratch. There has been development, there's been conservation efforts, and been a community long before we got here. And so as part of that, we have to kind of see, well, where are we landing right now in the growth cycles of things? So one of the first things we do is we look at what is the status of development that's going on right now in your community? And you see it's really easy to start with. We just start with where the the water 
where's the edge, where, where's the land areas and things. Uh, and then we put on there, where is sort of your open space? And part of this is your resource protection areas and things that have come out of your previous plan, as well as land holdings that are there from the land trust conservation perspective, other green space and other areas. We want to recognize that. This is the start of the conservation part of that conservation and growth map. We then add to that sort of where these other areas are here that are the civic areas. Where are these areas that you can come together and be a community and make sure we recognize those and the gravity that they have to bring you together. And then ultimately we start to look at, well, how about some areas that can grow but might be limited in growth? And again, this is where we were able to go back to your 2006 plan. We are able to interact um, quite frequently and regularly with some of your infrastructure service providers. Where can infrastructure be put? Where can it not? Where is it expensive to put it? Where is it more economically efficient to put it? All that stuff kind of goes into our thinking in terms of a recommendation that we would bring forward for you in this map. And so we want to know kind of where are the areas that are uh, served less by infrastructure right now, predominantly water and sewer, because that's controlling the development type, the intensity, the location, the pattern for which you may or may not want moving forward. Infrastructure is a big darn deal. Even though it's underground, you don't see it. It really is driving what's going on in this community. Then we looked and just said, well, where are you developed now? Because those areas have something on them right now. Do they need to redevelop for any reason? Or are they areas that are stable? Do we, are they what they want to be for many years to come? And so we want to look at that as well as we move forward. And then ultimately, what's left to develop? Where are those vacant areas that don't have environmental constraints or have not had the market come to them yet? But where are those areas that we might want to concentrate on as opportunities to see new development going on? And how does that complement and work with the existing development that is already in the town? And so this map really kind of gives us uh, a litmus test of where you've been and where you're going. And then we start to also think of things like what are the demographics and the, and the economics in the area? What's going to drive and attract growth here? Sam Green talked a little bit about all your job growth and those things that are attracting demand here. Uh, then we would look at well, what are developers doing? What kind of products are they providing right now? What type of policies and rules and ordinances do you have in place right now to get the type of development that you want? What does market like? We all know that we may all want to see something perfect, but if the bank won't loan for that type of product, it's really hard to start to see those things get built. So all that stuff is swirling around when we're looking at this kind of development status and where it is in the town to kind of come up with our maps. So as part of that, we then look at those undeveloped areas first, but we're also concentrating on all of those areas because they have to complement each other and things as we go. So if we switch our mind to the actual conservation and growth map, and again, this is through the one time, the one document that the town has to really state in a picture on a map where it wants its future to go. So it's really important we do this. What we're showing you is what happens after 36, 48, 52 long hours that we spent together, really just kind of getting the ideas on the paper. But between now and before this document is adopted with town council, your fingerprints need to be all over this. You need to be comfortable with the direction the compass is pointing for your future. So for today's discussion, we talk about and go back to those conservation areas. We want to protect those and make those an asset. One of the really nice things that you start to see in this community is how you're starting to connect that green asset together. It's a green infrastructure plan, a green uh, fingerprint, so to speak, within the community. And it's not just these little islands of things, but you actually have systems. Systems create identity and brand, and they actually do something for you. So we're really excited to see that. Uh, we then go back and say, well, you do have those limited growth areas. And before we just say you should grow everywhere edge to edge, we need to recognize there's a cost to grow. And so we want to look at that cost and say, well, look at where your undeveloped land is now, where you can redevelop, uh, where your environmental considerations and things are. There are some areas that maybe it's just not true within our time frame to just extend infrastructure in every different direction and hope that we hit one of those lucky spots. So we want to be very prudent and very focused when we do our infrastructure investments in, in the direction we want to grow. So we're recognizing that there are still limited growth areas, which is something that came out of your previous plan. We then want to recognize sort of what we're calling your more conventional suburban type development. So this is development where you probably drive to it. There's not in some of those conditions about how to walk between them, uh, maybe a little bit subpar for what we've been hearing through the week. Uh, but these are areas where you may live in one area and you have to travel to another area to shop or to work or those kind of things. There's a separation.
population, actual distance between those areas. And so we want to recognize where there are, where there are suburban neighborhoods and where there are suburban destinations. And how do we plan for how those interact and continue to thrive as we move forward. And then really where we've been challenged this week to work with you all is kind of what happens in those activity centers, those areas to really concentrate, create activity and growth, um, a mix of uses, walkable environments, something more compact, more cohesive, working with the street, and things of that nature. And so we've really kind of focused on these areas. And of course, we didn't want to take them and treat you all the same, so we wanted to create sort of a hierarchy of those areas. So the largest area that you see in purple, kind of in the middle, would be the Scarborough Down site, for which St. Green said there's been a lot of discussion about what happens there, what do we do there. Um, regardless of the vehicle of how something happens there, I think it's nearly 100% uh, input that we've got that we should think about what happens there. It's a great opportunity for you, a big, large site. So we're thinking that's kind of a, a walkable center that has regional significance, regional draws, maybe a large employment center, or something else that's really continuing to bring focus into Scarborough within the larger region and even beyond into multiple states. You then see that in red there is something that we call our community activity centers. Those would be less intense than what you would see planned on the purple. That would be the Oak Hill and the Dunstan areas. And you see though that we still want to have a mix of uses. We'd like to have residential and office and civic and green space and parks and shopping and all those kind of things really playing together as a community. Brian will be able to show you some really great examples of like what that means when these colors come to life here. Then you see in the orange, we heard a lot, and we really agree that kind of reinvesting, reinventing the, the Route 1 corridor is important as well. Um, call it the walkable miles or whatever you want to call it. Um, but it's where uh, the public infrastructure, what we call sometimes the public realm, those things like street trees and sidewalks and travel lanes and how you cross and all that stuff, should have some complement to the type of development that's going on either side of that road. And we really think it's a chance to really brand yourself like some of the other communities have done on Route 1 as well. <clears throat> then the last thing we have here is if you remember, um, we, we had asked and we're, we're given a map of kind of your seven sort of historical villages. And we started with that map and we kind of looked and evaluated those things. We're, we're advocating and asking you to maybe move away a little bit from where you have, you know, um, I didn't count, but it feels like 37 different land use categories that are here current plan. And the reason for it is they're not really that different, but they all have to have a name that ties back to a village or something else. And so what we're asking you to maybe do is recognize how similar some of those areas are, and they're already in your, your, your current comprehensive plan described that way. So maybe think of it more as that hierarchy of, okay, if we want to create a large, large activity center that has a lot of energy and puts us on the map in a very big area, that purple, what do we do within that circle? And then if we want to have those community areas that are really focusing on serving you all and your friends and visitors, what do we do there? And the corridor, what do we do in those little areas that are just those special places within Scarborough, either towards the beach or towards the north and things? What is it you're going to do to keep that character? And those could be things that go on top of or supplement or work with the uses that are there. So they're more design focused, character focused on what you can do there. Um, so we really think that would be a good direction for you to think about as we go. The other thing, I told you that this is the one document that this, this topic is really addressed in and becomes adopted in your policy. In those areas that are circles is where we also try to launch off into talking about your community as a system. Don't just talk about transportation alone or housing alone or uh, resiliency alone because really in the built environment they all work together. And so in these areas, especially in circles, you might say, let's talk about active living. What does active living mean? We'll have some discussion about that. Or, think, or things that really are about systems working together, and those will launch off from this map of where these circles are. Kind of thing. So, very important map. We're introducing it to you tonight just for discussion, but over the months, this is one of those things, if you only have limited time, really concentrate on what you see from this map. All right, the other topic for which uh, I was asked to speak with you this evening is this return on investment. And if you were here at the opening, or I, I was fortunate to have conversations with you sort of through the week, uh, we have this real interest, and I'm really excited about that. To do my, my bumper sticker in the beginning was to keep visioning from becoming hallucination. This is an opportunity to kind of put numbers behind some of these ideas, see what it's like. I mean, are we 
uh, is this the next you know, 25 bond ideas are coming out of this plan or something, right? Or what is happening? Can we be prepared? Those kind of things. And so we are doing a return on investment study that is part of this project. Now, we are interacting with the comprehensive plan, and I have one hat on that I'm actually an author and be writing parts of that plan. And then I'm also the lead author on this return on investment study. Now, there is a little bit of a difference when we do these things. When we write the comprehensive plan, we will, with you as a community, be advocating for things that you want. You saw those guiding principles. You see that map. You see other recommendations. You are advocating for your future. With the return on investment study, we are trying to just provide you information. So if you want to go down path A or path B in the return on investment study, I'm just saying be prepared. If you want to do and, and, and build something in a certain way or grow in a certain direction, just know that these are your outcomes and consequences. Be prepared. And here's another way you can do it, and we'll have those trade-offs that will help us make some of those harder decisions when we're actually going to take a position in the comprehensive plan document. So we're creating information when we look at this return on investment study. Not just now, but looking well out into the future. So as part of that, we have a process that we're following, and, and you see we're, we're moving along here. Um, so we were here actually the week before this, collecting data, doing interviews, meeting with department heads, trying to immerse ourselves within the community to know how you do your business. This week was all about getting the methodology. And I'll tell you, you all did a great job because, you know, we came here on Monday and we had a certain way we were going to do it. And by the end of the day, you've expanded my scope, right? You've made me do some more stuff, which is great, but it's the right thing to do so we can tell the whole picture and the total picture with a return on investment study. So we now leave here this week with a very good understanding of what the methodology is needed to answer the questions that you have about return on investment. Once we get back, after a good night's sleep, we'll start doing scenario testing, which is really just kind of looking at different ways you can grow and what are those trade-offs that we can report back to you. We will create a document. So there will be a written snapshot of time with today's assumptions about what we think from our studies and our recommendations because of that. But really what I'm most excited about is we're going to be delivering the tool that we create to do this and creating the tool in a way with the intention of knowing that town staff will have this tool to use at their disposal moving forward to think about these things as you go on. We will, give, we will have a set of assumptions that we're thinking about. The only thing I can guarantee you is those assumptions change over time. You may have an opportunity to come in on the Scarborough Town site that we didn't think about today but maybe a wonderful opportunity tomorrow, well, this tool will allow you to kind of adjust and see what that means to you. So that tool will be in your hands as you go forward. So don't think of this as, as a document. This is a new way of thinking. This is a new set of tools that you now have as a town to be able to do more informed decision making, whether it's budget approvals or, or just looking at, at growth in general or how you're going to fund things either annually or <coughs> long-term capital projects and plans. This is now another tool that you all have for more confidence. So we will do our scenario testing, as I mentioned. We have two scenarios that we've been asked to kind of look at. One is, where are you going now? And what if we find out where you're at is perfect, right? With the information that we give you. So we're going to do first, what happens if you build out under your 2006 comprehensive plan? We're going to look at it as if you build it out completely. And we're also going to look at about 20 years of growth to kind of see well, what is the biggest urgency and where the demand is going to be. Then we're also going to take the plan as it evolves, that conservation growth map, and be able to give you that information as well. We feel it wouldn't be fair for you to act on adopting a path forward in your map, in your new plan, if you didn't know what the outcomes were. We want you to be able to compare those things. And so we'll do that for you and give you that information as well. Now, as we look at those two things, we're really challenging ourselves to think about, just in broad terms, different ways you can grow. Do you want to infill your growth? So, for example, do you extend infrastructure west of the turnpike, or do you stay east of the turnpike? What does site development look like? What does density look like? Land uses look like, and where they're located? All controls kind of some of those impacts to infrastructure, which controls a lot of the costs to provide government services, and the wealth that's created and then that whole outward expansion thing as well. So I mentioned you all did a great job of growing my scope. So here's kind of what we will be looking at as we move forward in this return on investment study. 
So the growth and conservation map, and also understand that's your future land use map from 2006 as well, is going to sit, it's going to nest within all these other topics that we're going to look at how does a community provide those services that its citizens, businesses, and, and visitors would want to have. And so we're going to be looking at all of these things, things like fire and police and public safety, uh, roads and schools and parks and all of that are things you do. But then also we're all going to look at some of those topics that although you're not directly controlled over, like the sanitary sewer district or the water sewer district, that really have a big influence on where you grow, how you grow, and what kind of way you grow. So we're going to report that information as well. So with return on investment, there's basically a numerator, which is how much money you're making, and then there's a denominator, which is how much things cost to provide those services. You really want that that uh, math to be greater than 1.0, and you know you're kind of in a really good place and a good direction. So some of the stuff that we did this week was kind of look at that development status map, like I was telling you about, but we do it a little bit deeper. So some of the things we talked about was what does it mean uh, to create revenue? What does it mean to create more or less money in order to provide those things? We talked earlier uh, with some folks who came in during the session and said, well, you know, you can either have your valuation go up or you have your tax rate, your millage rate goes up, and there's all these ways to create uh, more money for you. But what if the land itself is just more productive, generating more wealth for you as well? And so we went around and looked and we said, well, you know, you build residential development, but you can build it differently all over the place, right? So one of the things we pulled, if you look at these numbers, you just see we took three neighborhoods. And these could be any three neighborhoods. We're not picking on anybody or highlighting anybody. We just picked three out of them. You see that each neighborhood has a certain size that it is. Each neighborhood, if we add it up with the assessor data, all of the value, the total value building plus land value that was reported for those areas, you get an amount of money that then gets taxed. But in order to normalize it among everything, how efficient, how productive that land is now, we divide it by the acreage of that site to see how much and how efficient does it contribute revenue. And so you can see that there are all different spectrums for how you generate wealth, how you create value within the community. If you look at it from a residential standpoint, um, I go into communities sometimes and they all say, man, we're so happy when that Walmart came in because that's the biggest generator we've got. Well, I'll actually challenge you a little bit to tell you when you look at the size of the Walmart and you look at the size of the building that we were in, uh, uh, in Bessie Square, is actually the Bessie Square is more efficient, more productive per acre than the Walmart's. And so which one, when, you start, when we start to look at that map, which one do we want to put more of? Because we have a land consumption thing we have to think about, we have a tax uh, production thing we have to think about, we have all those guiding principles we have to think about, but all of our decisions have real impacts. And again, the return on investment study is trying to enumerate those impacts so we can provide and can maybe make some perceptions, realities when we're thinking about what this means. So as you apply that out to a whole town-wide, the data doesn't, doesn't lie. It starts to tell us there are some land uses that tend to be um, lower on the scale of producing value per acre, and there are some that tend to be higher on the scale of doing value per acre. This is a study we did called Connect Our Future in the Charlotte, North Carolina region where I'm from, and it was 14 counties, 7,100 miles, 120 cities and towns. This data set is enough to tell you where the trend is. And what you see here is the rural living and even some of the suburbans, they have peaks and valleys on which ones are more productive or less productive from generating uh, value. But the mixed use ones always tended to do better. Well, part of it's kind of a loaded question because they're more dense, right? And they're, they're just having more things there for which you can create more value for. But the mixed use categories always tended to trend out better. And while I'm anxious to see what happens when we look at the, the conservation growth map here to see if that holds true as well. Now beyond kind of that numerator, we want to also look at the denominator. So how is infrastructure provided? You saw that list of all the different categories we're going to look at. But we're going to look at not just when it's built, but we're going to look at how much it costs to maintain it and operate it, how much it costs to rehabilitate it. So you see we have our four, what we call our life cycle of infrastructure. So sometimes I'll go into places and they'll and you take transit, for example, and they'll say, wow, I got a grant for a free bus. And they're like, oh, you're in trouble now. Because now you got to pay for a driver, you got to pay for a maintenance person, you got to pay for gas. You gotta... 
bills keep going on and they repeat all the time. And so be leery of a free bus unless you're ready to take on the full free bus. Uh, and so this is also what we're going to kind of look at. For all those categories that you saw in green circles, we're going to be looking at what does it cost to build it the first time, to operate it, to rehabilitate it, to maintain it. And then ultimately, if we're lucky enough with the data that we have, we'll be able to look at things like this. And we say, well, here's where infrastructure is either more expensive or less expensive. Here's where we have more or less value being created per acre. What happens if we compare those two numbers? There'll be some areas of the town that are actually creating more wealth than they need. And there'll be some areas of town that are that cost more than they're making in order to serve them. And you see you end up with a graph kind of like this. This is a, a friend of ours, a good consultant who had done this in Louisiana. And you start to really kind of just see peaks and valleys. For them, everything you see in the black was sort of kind of downtown area. And it was, it was producing a tremendous amount of value and the infrastructure needs because everything was closer together and stuff that we're able to share those costs and per unit was actually cheaper than extending infrastructure right now. And so that was something they found here. Right. So it ends up being both in the end. So you end up creating value for the developer because then they continue to want to invest more and more and do more and put the finishing pieces in there that you have to have to have the buildings that really work for you, or the, the pedestrian environments that are there for you. They don't um, uh, skip out on the details. They want to really create place at that point because they see a return on investment to them. But also on the municipal side, we're trying to find ways that you continue to have money to come in because we all know it really hurts with all the money that can go out. And so we want to try to balance that out. Just in case anybody's, you know, I get really excited about doing math and return on investments, but I want to pull us back to the comprehensive plan here for a minute and be, be very um, honest and real with you here to say, look, we are going to do a return on investment study that you could use to optimize your decision making if, if the bottom line and efficiencies from a dollar perspective is your number one priority. But as you saw in those guiding principles, as you'll see in the planning process you, you've been through so far, the document that comes, Pick any one of those are important things to being a true, strong, cohesive community. And sometimes it means we don't always choose the most cost-efficient uh, alternative or route, but it's because we're achieving another goal we have as a community. And so again, the return on investment, instead of being uh, an advocacy tool, is going to be an information tool. The advocating will occur as you all decide as a community what you want to have for your company. So I kind of leave you with a new adage we sort of had an epiphany years and years ago um, and how we do these things. And so on the left-hand side, what you see is a, is a blueprint for a clock. And if you follow every step in that blueprint, you will have a functioning clock. But if any one of those steps is wrong or skipped or didn't make the right assumption, that is no longer a working clock. So we're trying to move away, at least on the return on investment side, of creating a document that has to be followed so to the T, otherwise that future that you hope for is not achieved. Instead, we're trying to take more of the playbook approach, which is why we're putting the tool in your hands, is to say, if right now the past play is the thing to do because of what you have in front of you, but if we need to go to the run play, let's run it through the tool and get that feedback so we can make that right decision. And with the tool, it's not just looking what is next year or what is the next bond, uh, vote or those kind of things. But this is the tool that will allow you to look out multiple years at the time. So maybe when you're starting to think about five years of capital improvements, or you're starting to think of just well, how do we um, space out the ways that we're going to collect and make money, this is a tool that will allow you to look at that because it looks all the way up to full. Our uh, current budget is about $1.5 stuff. Um, I get to show you guys um, what we've done with all of the things that you've told us about, all of the visions that have come from each of your heads, and every one of you has a different vision when you say, we want walkability, or we want connectivity, or we, you know, our favorite villages, and moving this, you know, what the previous comp plan set forward. Now, the good news is that nearly everybody that we talk to, there's been strong consensus on sort of a direction forward. I will say with full 
full disclosure that we've met a couple of people who said, no, we don't like the idea of villages. We don't like the idea of, you know, um, making Room 1 uh, a nicer, more sort of civilized, pedestrian-friendly place. Um, we like the more suburban model that we've been doing um, for all these years. So, um, just so you know, um, there, there are you know, multiple opinions out there about this. Um, the good news is, though, when we start looking at the fundamental principles, the guiding principles that we have talked about, uh, and we look at the old comprehensive plan, it starts to give us guidance and direction as we start to decide which way, one way or the other, or somewhere in between uh, that we go. Um, and so, you know, if we know that we're concerned about um, the traffic, for instance, and we know that continuing on in a more suburban pattern makes the traffic worse, then we start to, that starts to tell us something, that starts to head us in a certain direction. If we know that we're concerned about you know, the environment and the marsh and you know, all the natural beauty that you have here, um, and we know that continuing on in a certain development pattern makes that worse, it creates the environment, then that tells us uh, also which way to go. And so we start heading in, in different directions now. The thing that's great about this, and something that not all communities do, is that you know you have the return on investment side of it too that comes and is a, an additional piece of information uh, that you're more analytical. Because what I'm going to show you here is the touchy feely side of things. It's the you know the artsy side. It's the side of you know uh, the dreaming big. You know one of the teams the other night um, at their table is called Team Big Thinkers. I think it was. You know, uh, and that's exciting. That's the way we like to think about ourselves too. So what I'm going to show you tonight um, are a series of plans and, um, and illustrations that we've done while we've been here. There's a couple of things uh, that we didn't do, and I'll point out what those are. They're, they're more dynamic. Um, but the thing that's really cool is nearly everything that you've seen so far tonight and what you're about to see is all stuff that we've created in the past two and a half days that we've been here. So that's why I'm uh, sort of have back to my eyes and you know, Matt was you know, sort of talking slowly. We're really tired, um, but we want to show you this stuff because it's really exciting. Um, now, what I'm going to show you is not necessarily a proposal for, here's what you need to do, here's what's going to happen in uh, Dunstan or Oak Hill um, or, you know, along Route 1. What I'm going to show you is, you can think of it in, in two ways. You can think of it as a proposal if you like. But you can also think of it as, uh, especially in Oak Hill, and I'll point out why, a way you could have done things differently to have more of the outcome that you've asked for at this point, right? And so, you know, a series of planning decisions go along and zoning decisions go along over time that lead you to a certain type of environment uh, that you find out uh, when you walk outside. Um, and so if you want to do something different, uh, we have, we're have we creating the tools and the dialogue for you, to, you guys to do that. But what we know is when we talk about all these principles and concepts and we use planner jargon and all of these things, sometimes it's like, okay, well that sounds pretty good. Uh, yeah, sure, I like that. But when I show you these images and these pictures, you can really respond to it. Uh, you can say, wow, if that's, if that's what he means, absolutely, this is like, so exciting. And he, he really nailed exactly what I had in mind. Or, wow, that's really scary to me. That's not at all what I was thinking, and I'm concerned about the, the impacts of this. Um, so as we go, just think about it. We want to get your impact, because we've talked about what is this character that you're looking to protect. And I've just been sort of trying to drag that out of each of you and then hear each person's version of that. So hopefully the, the, the plans and images that you see will, will reflect that, uh, the vision, um, the character that you're, that you're thinking about. So when we talk about Route 1, um, and we talk about, you know, it's really auto-oriented. We've said that a lot, right, so far. So these are a series of diagrams that we created when we were working in Yarmouth. And they were struggling with Route 1, and what do we do about our Route 1? And it's not really, you know, it's like some of the other Route 1s where people actually stop. They don't just drive through and use our infrastructure and clog up our roads. People stop in these other places that have these more walkable, sort of village feeling places. So we created a series of diagrams to show how you could do auto-oriented things in a more pedestrian-friendly way. And so this is actually a drive-through restaurant where you enter here, you come around, you go through the drive-thrus on the back, and then you go out the other side. Um, this is a drive-through pharmacy, same thing. You come in here, and we have little plans to go along with these. Um, and the drive throughs in the back, but there's also the pedestrian uh, side of things. And, and, and one difference, you guys did this nearly, right, um, in Oak Hill. Uh, and it even has the, the, what we call the chamfered corner like that. Um, the difference is that in, in your version of this, it's uh, sunk in, in the ground. Um, that's just a part of the topography that was, you know, I'm sure, already existing there. Um, 
but it makes it where you're not likely to sort of walk up to that side of the building. And also, the building isn't oriented to the street that way. It's not, you know, I think there's like some blinds or something there that, you know, there may be some windows, but, um, but it's certainly not um, a streetscape experience where it's a wonderful looking pharmacy, though, as pharmacies go. Uh, but here, you know, the idea would be that there's uh, uh, the components of the people walking along the streets, and then the cars can go in the back. Um, here is a bank. Uh, you can see the drive throughs here. The tellers come through. Again, you come in the back. You get the idea. It's a pretty simple thing, but people, it's like mystifying um, to a lot of people. Uh, we did a gas station. We call this gas backwards. Uh, right? So here's the pumps here. You come in, you go gas backwards, and then you go out the other side there. But this is the convenience store. We just flip the location and put it up to the corner. And now it's you know, part of the nice streetscape. Um, and even something uh, as um, auto oriented as a car dealership, right? They used to do these in downtowns all the time. Uh, and so here, you know, you have a little plaza where the cars can park in the front, you know, a few from on display, like in Europe or something, um, and you go in here. Now, I know you guys have been particular about uh, car dealerships, and, and so we learned that um, uh, not too long ago. But I thought I would show you this anyway, just uh, because it's kind of interesting to think about that. Now, um, as we were looking at Oak Hill, um, here is Route 1 here, here's the, the pharmacy I was just talking about, here's the school. Um, I started to notice and, and really sort of focus on the corner here, you know, there's a lot of land in this, in this parcel, uh, and there's a lot of buildings, and they're sort of scattered about, right? Like if you think about like, how, did, how did this get laid out in the first place, right? Um, you know, you wonder was there a master plan or a vision for how it would be, or was it more sort of an opportunistic evolution over time? Where you say, oh well, you know, I have a new tenant, or I need a new building space, so oh, there's some space right there, and then I'll put in another building right there, right? So through the magic of Photoshop, um, I started uh, cutting and pasting the buildings. Uh, I just pulled them right off the picture here, uh, and watch what happens here when we turned it into sort of this walkable uh, environment. So I took all the same buildings, right? So here's the L here and the green roof and all the same buildings and now I've just oriented it there and look what happened. All of a sudden all of this is freed up and available and we have the whole backside here for more stuff and you know there's all kinds of things that can happen. Uh, and so it's just a more efficient way to lay it out um, and you also create a place in the process uh, and it's really fun. You, we can do that these days. And, and so, so I said, well, what if we take that one step further? Because I know this is identified as sort of an important hub, a village node, and all that. Um, and uh, and so, well, if they had done it differently from the beginning, this was maybe sort of the first phase. Um, what could we do to take that one step farther and really uh, focus on, you know, sort of holistically creating a place instead of just focusing on this one corner? Now. What happens is that um, this area here is, uh, has a conservation easement on it, right? And so we can't do anything there. Um, we know too that this is you know, serious traffic. We saw our clever restriping that solved a major traffic problem, hopefully, um, that happened here. Uh, but we know that that's just one part of the problem. And so what we would like to do, and one of the ways we solve traffic problems is, is having a connected network of streets. And so instead of forcing all the cars to go through here, even if you have sort of secondary sort of brackets, if you will, around the intersection, you actually can go where you want to go without having to go through the intersection. So I was looking for opportunities to do that as well. Yes? <clears throat> There is here, right? And then there's a there's a thing here and here, but the rest of it is in conservation easement. There's a, is there there's a conservation easement, right? This is an old picture. Right. So there's a few things that aren't on here yet. Thank you for pointing that out. Yes. So we were working with the most recent aero photographer we had available. Um, so what we did was uh, here I just zoomed out a little bit. Okay. So reorient yourself. Uh, here's Route One. Here's the school. Here's the drugstore. Um, and so here's uh, we got the downs over here, um, and then there's all this property up here as well, just to the north of Hannaford. And so we zoomed out, and one of the things we know is that when you're trying to have a, a proper village, one of the things you tend to have is it's actually a, sort of a critical mass of people and things. So it's not just people who have to drive there, but people who actually can live in that proximity and could walk through any of these things. They could go get some ice cream like we did yesterday. But without risking their lives, we walked actually from our, our uh, Planet Palooza studio down to, uh, to get ice cream. It was a wonderful ice cream and not a great walk. Um, so, 
Uh, so anyway, so here's what we did. Um, remember, we reconfigured this, um, and you'll see here's that, and here's those pieces on the front. And all of a sudden now, what we've done is, uh, is um, begun to create a real village pattern here. Uh, here's a new uh, village common on the corner here. We've moved a building back. And again, this is not necessarily suggesting that you do this. Certainly anybody who owns a business that I've moved, don't freak out. Right? This is an illustration to show some, an idea, right? Um, and so this is Hannaford. Here's Hannaford, and so instead of a little strip that kind of comes off the side here and the giant parking lot in front, we put a smaller parking lot in the front uh, that has buildings that uh, hide it. So you can you know that it's there because it has a good signage, um, but there's a nice streetscape, and now there's a, a wonderful um, village green here. Uh, you have copious amounts of parking um, to provide for all of these things here, the businesses. You have people living above these businesses as well. And as you move up towards the residential neighborhoods, the character starts changing. And so you go from uh, people living above shops to some apartment houses to row houses to detached single family houses that are smaller. Uh, and then they get larger and even larger as you go to the edge. And the other thing that we've done is focus on uh, these uh, wetland areas here. And you know, I know that you guys can sort of move wetlands around and things with you know, proper mitigation and all that, but we thought it would be nice to make this a, an actual feature of amenity. Um, and so we've left this big area here, and this house is actually face onto it. It's now really public. It's not tucked away in the back, and you're not sure if you can go back there or not. People can, you know, there's a street that goes in front, and you can look at it as you walk by or drive by. And then we sort of uh, have a stormwater conveyance here as, as a little greenway between these two so we don't impact the functionality of the wetlands as it comes through. So we've been sort of thinking big picture stormwater and environmental stewardship and all of these things that go into it. Um, and then, you know, other moves like uh, connecting all these streets across here and, and you know, there's some, the schools here and tons of people are going kind of back and forth and so you civilize the road here, um, uh, the highway. Uh, so that people feel more comfortable walking across because you're going to get a bunch of um, possibly students to live here. If you have a new elementary campus, it happens up there. You know, on and on and on. So this kind of becomes a neighborhood <laughs> school area. Uh, you get more people walking than just a few little cul-de-sacs. And we've connected in uh, over here as well. Again, uh, usually when we show that, the people who uh, live nearby think it's a great idea. The people who live on the street hate the idea. We know that. So, uh, so we're just showing this to talk about how connectivity works, and maybe it should be in future streets, but it could also be for those people who say, wow, well, if all this cool stuff is going in here, I definitely want this to connect. I don't want to be disconnected from it, or I want to have a trail. Um, so anyway, so that's a big idea. And remember the Hannafords here. So uh, we had our render do a view as if you're standing in the park here, looking over uh, to the Hannaford. So this is kind of a weird image. This is a, a Google. 3D image and it sort of drapes the skin over it, so it looks bizarre. You recognize here's Hanford and here's the giant parking lot. And here's what it could be like instead. So here's Hanford prominently displayed at the end of the street, its main entrance here. Uh, here's some little shops going, here's a, a breezeway to the, to the parking lot uh, in the rear. Um, then this is the outdoor seating area. There's little bistro lights hanging between. There's you know people living above shops here. You know it's just a, a wonderful experience in the new uh, civic space where people can go and hang out and throw frisbee and whatnot. And people are walking around to getting their daily needs met. Uh, and I hope this is Beetle Scoops. Um, over there, I see Scoops. We don't want to have any issues. So anyway, uh, moving down the road uh, to Dunstan. Um, this was actually a little bit easier uh, as I was working on the planning side, but there weren't as many sort of things that had happened over the time. There wasn't as much focus and development that happened here, so there was more uh, land that was available and it, it was sort of developed more linearly and more sparsely. Um, so this is currently the historic building here that has uh, several different businesses in it. Uh, I can't remember what the name of that is called. Yeah, it's have a name. Anyway, you guys know what I'm talking about. It's like an old hotel. It's really cool. Um, and uh, then the, so the darker red buildings are historic. Uh, so we definitely want to you know, kind of, um, you know, protect and preserve those. Um, again, I took a few liberties uh, in this sort of suburban strip retrofit concept that we uh, talked about. But we also look for opportunities to do things in some of these areas that are available. Uh, so here you go. So like before. And after. So here's that same building. So keep your eye on that building as I flip between the two. 
So now we've made a town common here. A little green space here with a little statue that's there. Um, you have the, here's gas backwards. Remember I showed you gas backwards earlier? So we did gas backwards here because there's already a gas station there. Uh, and so now it holds the streetscape. Um, we have parking in the rear for all of these things. Um, we have a great civic space. We have a mix, a diversity of housing types here. These are orange ones are row houses and apartment houses here and detached single family as you get to the neighborhoods. We've shown connections through um, to the streets here that are currently cul-de-sacs, um, new little neighborhood scale parks, uh, preserving wetlands and uh, tree canopy as much as we can, um, finding opportunities to connect through so we don't have so much pressure on the intersection here. So here's a new street that could connect through here. There's also opportunities to connect through uh, further down the road uh, as this cuts off. Um, so there's a multitude of ways to kind of deviate around and not have to go through the intersection if you don't want to. Now, here's a weird thing to think about. Our traffic engineer is not here, um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll say it uh, in, a, in a less technical way than he does, but with a place like this, you guys are um, on the verge of something, right? You complain about the traffic because it's pretty bad. I mean, I hear a lot of towns like you guys say, oh, our traffic's so bad, and then we go out there and it's like, there's nothing to it compared to most places. It's just different. Um, but here, it, it is a bit tricky. Um, and so, as we as we think about um, why that is, a lot of the traffic that you have, as uh, Sandra pointed out earlier, is through traffic, not to traffic. So all your neighbors, the north and east and west, and all these other places are coming through and sort of using your road, clogging up your, you know, the traffic and causing these issues that you're experiencing. The reason they do that is because it's convenient enough for them to do so, right? And so there's this weird idea in, in, in tra transportation engineering where you actually make it worse to make it better. Because if all of a sudden it's really not that great, then people say, wow, I'm not going to go through there anymore except for when I want to go have this wonderful experience in the village and do all these things like they do in these other places, right? And they'll still go through. You guys will have all these sort of alternate ways to get around because you know how to move around with the, with the new connections and all that. Now, that sort of making it worse to make it better thing, it seems counterintuitive, and it also only lasts for a certain period of time, because there's people who are doing it, um, they start you know, having new habits, uh, and then you've now got uh, a village, and you go slow, and you stop, and you see the stores and the shops, and you get out, and you park your car once, you walk to a multitude of things, so you're also decreasing the traffic. Um, but you've got a village now. And so these are kind of interesting things to talk about now. Some of the people, you know, the two people that I talked to that said, I don't want a village. I just said exactly what they're afraid of, right? It might get worse. Um, and, you know, I'm not all that interested in the village. And so as we look at trade-offs and those kind of things, you have to think about that. Um, but as long as we're not just simply saying, let's make a village and hopefully, you know, Route 1 will, will be okay. As long as we're making these additional connections and doing other things to alleviate the traffic problems, it starts to offset, and hopefully there's you know, really a, a negligible impact. Uh, but that's just what happens in great villages. People drive slow. The stores actually can do better, because um, people are saying, like, instead of, oh, darn, I just passed the hardware store because I was going too fast or whatever, they're now saying, oh, there's the hardware store, let me stop, and while I'm there, I'll get some ice cream, and I'll get this, and I'll get that. So, so anyway, so here's a, a plan, a, a potential different way of doing things. Uh, here's the bird's eye view. So here's the cool historic building. Uh, I really love this. Here's the gas station, Route 1, with all of its many, many lanes. Um, and here is possible change in transformation. So you have the before, so keep your eye there. Here it is here, the after. So here's that town common. Here's the gas backwards. Here's, you know, this looks like a real place that grew up in, over time, you know, and can you imagine a, an organic evolution and growth of people living above shops and, you know, in apartments or single family houses or row houses, um, and, you know, Easter lights, you know, strung between little market kiosk buildings and, you know, all of these kind of things uh, with the parking sort of tucked away neatly in the back so you don't have to see it from the front. You see nice wide sidewalks and street trees and possibly on-street parking and all of these different things that go into making a village uh, in certain areas and in other areas you leave it more auto-oriented so you can drive faster and do all those things and kind of get on your way. So here's another one of those weird views. So this is looking up uh, Route 1 here. Uh, here's the historic building on the right. Um, and here is uh, how you could possibly transfer, 
transform this, and I've taken some you know, real liberties here. Um, we haven't run the synchro models with it, the synchro, sorry, it's the, it's the animation that Sandrine showed you. She said we played around, that's actually like highly, highly advanced technology uh, that real engineers use. It's not just, uh, that's actually what happens uh, using like artificial intelligence and all kinds of stuff, it's cool. Um, but we haven't run this through, but we just want to show you how you can transform because people, we heard over and over, our root one is root one, right? So no, it's not. It actually can be changed. People are changing highways all around the country. Uh, to become more like this. So this is Route 1. So you've got a, a drive lane, through lane here, through lane here, turn lane in the middle, on street parking, crosswalks here with people actually walking, you know, slowly. They're not running across because they've uh, run out of time and there's a car barreling down and then there's cafes and, uh, you know, Village Green here. Here's our gas backwards, holding down the street, sticking people actually living above and facing on. Uh, to Route 1. And so, you know, this is quite a, a different uh, experience than what you have here. We love these big trees that are here, by the way, but for the illustration, we took them out um, just so you can see what's happening behind. So you see the historic building there. And it'll be really cool. It has a, a Dunstan sign kind of like up on the, on the eave there. So you know you're kind of like in the heart of, of Dunstan. So anyway, um, these are kind of the, the fun things we've been thinking about. Um, kind of give you guys something to, to consider and to talk about. Again, um, you know, don't take, don't get your hopes up if you loved it, and don't freak out if you hated it. Um, these are just ideas um, to uh, to marry that on. So, most importantly, I know we've been here for a while, so um, but we had a lot to cover, even though we've only been here for a little time. We want to hear from you guys. Um, we're going to sit here as long as you guys are willing to chat. Um, hold the chair. And uh, share your thoughts. Um, Hopes, dreams, aspirations, concerns, fears? Yes. Okay. We'll be equal then. Yes. Um, I've just been thinking as we go along, my wife's parents, I think, um, uh, 
Um, as you look at all of this stuff, I, I know that we had a fairly good turnout, but certainly could be better. And I met people that I have no clue about where they are. Uh, I've lived in Scotland so long. I, I thought I knew everybody, but now I really don't know anybody. Um, but I, I think as we move along in the process, I'd like to see us uh, have give some help uh, with technical resiliency and sustainability as it relates to electronic uh, equipment, i.e. developing some podcast situations, uh, some Instagrams. Let's look at what the younger people are using to communicate because we didn't get them. We didn't get them here. And they're the ones that are going to be here in that future. And why should we be, you know, giving all the data? Because we're, we're obviously, we're missing something. We're missing the contact with our younger folks. And I did speak with a resiliency person and asked her what to do. And she suggested one thing is that get the 18 year olds in the high school involved in developing a podcast, developing it, so that it has the information, kind of information that the young folks want and they want to have. Because if they're part of this solution or this plan, they're going to hopefully go off to college and come back and be here and live here. So I'd like to see some component of the comprehensive plan address how we uh, notify our, our, our citizens because uh, our council is constantly being badged and they say they're not transparent and they're not listening and, you know, get, get all of that. And, and they are, but I don't know if we're reaching all of them the way, the way they're, they want their information. Now that's a great point. Thank you for bringing that up. And one thing that you may not know if you were at the presentations or at the technical meetings uh, and didn't happen to be dropping by the, our um, studio where we were working uh, at the right moment, we actually had an incredible turnout of young people because Laura and uh, the guests, that, so school superintendent went and they actually reached out to the, to the kids and um, they just kept coming one after the next after the next. It was really remarkable. And just so you know, too, uh, we probably should have told you this in case any of you are in witness protection, but um, we're doing a Facebook Live broadcast of this right now. So hopefully there's all kinds of kids at home on Facebook and Instagram and you know, watching uh, as we're doing this exciting presentation about economics and, and planning. But they do get excited about it. You know, when you start to think about the plan is really uh, for them, because what we've done here, you know, you have state requirements all across the country to revisit your comprehensive plan every 10 or 15 years. But the way that we plan, we think about it as really like a hundred year endeavor. You know, I've, I've shown you things here that are, are, you know, hopefully wouldn't happen overnight, right? That, that just, you know, they need to happen over time. Uh, and because we set this up based on these guiding principles rather than these fads and trends of planning, it should last. So the next time you're required to review it, you say, yeah, we nailed it in 2017. Um, and so this plan will be, you know, really focused on this, this future generation. But we also want to do things that, you know, even the eldest uh, in the town can see something happen in their lifetime. We want to have short-term, immediate successes that don't have to cost a ton of money. One thing I'll say, too, is most of what you saw in the, in the sort of the visioning side of this and the things we've talked about also, the majority of that transformation that's possible is actually on uh, with private dollars. It's on the private property. Like these things that I'm showing you, we're not proposing that you know, necessarily the town goes and builds this you know, sort of new village in, in Dunstan. These, these are, what we want to do is set in place the ability for people who own property in these places to execute a vision like this based on the input that you guys have been giving us this whole time. Um, I'll also say too, when people come and we say, you know, this is a, a decent turnout, um, but when you look at the entirety of the town and the, the population, this is a mere small fragment. The thing that's great, though, is while we want more, and like, every time there's a meeting about this, you need to start telling people to bring at least three friends with you. By the time we got to table number 10 in the workshop exercise, you realize table 10 was like, well, we pretty much don't have anything to say. They've all covered it. Actually, by the time we got to about table four, you started hearing the repetition of things. What we found in our work across the country is that even with a relatively small segment of the population coming, the themes are there. There might be that one person who has like, they're, they're like massively concerned about the state of quilting in your town or whatever, and they didn't 
to show up, right? But most people are talking about things like traffic, et cetera, et cetera. And so we're, we're, we're hearing all of the big picture topics. And it's surprising if something like two months from now sort of pops up that no one ever mentioned. But we have the online tools, we have you know, different ways that people can still give comment and really go through what you've gone through this week um, throughout uh, you know, the life of this. And then this plan will go through the, the, the actual normal review process. You know, this is this is not a, a, a an official process except for that it's sanctioned and sponsored by the town, and we're here to you know help you guys create the plan. This is a, a step that a lot of towns don't do. They just go write a plan and say, hey, we're going to approve it. What do you think? Um, but you still have all of the different hearings that have to come, and you know you, you guys will probably vote three times. Hopefully not, um, but three is a magic number here apparently. Um, so I'd like you guys to vote once on this. Um, so we, we have a, a plan. We're going to have the, the vote yes test, right? Um, so that will come down the way about one day, um, and we'll go from there. So we're getting more people out and different types of people. I mean, because a lot of the people that have been here, at both this, this one and the one prior, are already engaged. I mean, they're on committees, and they, and they really care about what, what's going to happen. Uh, and so we do need to talk it out. We need to talk it out with folks and say, you know, you know, come with me tonight. Listen to what's going on. Get involved. <coughs> Ask questions. As you say, we're going to have lots of reviews uh, because people have to vote to prove the comprehensive plan. So hopefully, we can get them engaged. We'll be pies and cider, probably. All right. I'm interested. Um, are there any gaps you and your team have identified, uh, or any issues you want to know more about? There probably are. Um, with it, we probably have a list of them that we'll be sort of reflecting back to you. Um, is there anything off the top of our heads right this moment that we say, oh, we really need to ask that? Yeah. Uh, I mean, for me, I had the benefit of coming out the week prior, so we kind of asked a lot of questions and learned the answers this week. Um, for me, on the revenue side, I, I keep finding out about things like the sales tax options and the hotel uh, accommodation tax things that you don't have the local options that other places do. It's the state that's getting all the money. Uh, so things like development impact fees is something I want to look at a little bit more. Uh, some of the tools just to kind of not just leave you with a recommendation but knowing that further consideration of how you might get there. So that's kind of what we're going to try to do. Really, the reason I ask, at the first session, and you've heard it, you might have heard it this week as well, there's a continued question or interest around why didn't we do a, a town-wide uh, opinion survey. Oh, right. And uh, I think our intent is if there's something we want to follow up on, we'd like to do and are prepared to do something very kind of targeted. So we'd love to hear back as you go back to your offices and digest this. If there's some piece of information or uh, further information you need, we're certainly prepared to do that. Well, as you know, it's, it's interesting. We, we've worked in communities that have done these surveys, and you know, these really scientific surveys, and they take tens of thousands of dollars and have you know, the universities conduct them and all that. And, and it's, it's a, the thing that's tricky about a survey, for me, uh, not to get into the weeds about it, not that I'm against them, but you don't have the context, you don't have the narrative. You have a question that you have to be really careful about how you work. It's like, well, you know, a survey we help questions and make sure because a lot of times if some, the person writing the survey doesn't understand even what's going on and the, 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 the whole results are skewed. But making sure that that narrative, um, uh, it, you know, they, for somebody to fill out the survey, they need to watch the presentation, that, that kind of thing. So maybe that's like at the top of the survey it says, make sure you go here first before you fill out the survey. Yes? So I have a couple of things. Um, in your experience, uh, we're going to need your experience with this question, I think. Uh, I'm listening to you saying that some of the properties that you're commenting about are private property, uh, not something that the town would have the ability to decide what to do with that piece of property. In Maine, we have very strong property rights opinions. And I'm wondering, in your experience in other places, how easy is it to get a private property owner to buy into something that they're not happy about and they feel like it's being done to them? And then secondly, in connection with the question you're asking, I have had 
prior experience in another town and man doing a comprehensive plan. And I was very much involved. And we were all so excited. And we used to get not very many people coming to the meetings. And we made this wonderful plan and everybody felt really good about it and the town council was in, a, in an agreement that it was a good step forward. And the, ta the, the, the town manager was really excited about it. And then the town council voted on it. And there was an uproar. It practically tore the town apart. It was in the newspapers. Um, town council members lost their positions on the town council. Um, and I'm wondering, in your experience, how can Scarborough try to avoid something like that, particularly in reference to what we were just now talking about, about getting people involved at least to know what's going to happen? Because what will happen is the vote will come, and the people who didn't know about it are the ones that are going to have the upset and maybe cause a, a tear of the community, which I know we all want to avoid. That's a great question. Um, so I'll start with the part about property rights. So in addition to working in Maine, we also work in New Hampshire. So, um, and so when you go to New Hampshire and, you know, you see their license plates and they're for your dying and all that stuff, like, they take it seriously too, uh, maybe even to a whole other level. Um, and so we've been there, we've seen that, we've experienced it. The thing that's interesting is um, the comprehensive plan, while it is a vision, it's that sort of guidance for the future, it is, uh, it's different than zoning. And a zoning actually tells you what you can and can't do with your property. Um, and, and it's funny because we had to remind people of that in New Hampshire, they're like, well, it tells me what to do with my property. So do you have zoning? Well, yes, a little bit. Yes. So uh, the zoning tells you what to do. Um, the thing that's great about it is that most we are zoning ordinances as well, right? So when we write the zoning ordinance, the first thing we do is we look at the grandfather clause, right? And say, oh yeah, people are you don't have to comply unless you change your property or whatever, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we're like so far from that point, even we're just at the conference of plans thing. We're setting that vision now. One of the things that when I asked Matt the question about um, are you talking about um, adding value to for a developer or for a municipality, he said both. Well, what we know is that these ideas of sort of place making and village making and all that have been tested enough now where you can see that the places and the developers who are doing this are the ones who are making the most money. So unless somebody happens to just not want to make money and they want to develop their property, um, then you know they tend to say, wow, this is great, I can do this now. So we, what we want to do is give people the choice, and in most places where we go work on zoning ordinances, the first thing we have to do is give them more rights to their property, because most places are set up to give you conventional suburban sprawl in the zoning, which says your building has to be set back from the street and have a giant parking lot in front of it and have this many parking spaces per thousand square feet, and so on, so on, whatever. And all of these different things that, that create a suburban environment, even in places where that's kind of out there, people don't want to do that anymore. And so what we're doing is giving people more choices with what they can do with their property to add value to it um, and allow you to meet the larger goals of being you know, sort of more um, compact and in your development footprint, et cetera. So that's the, the property rights thing. And it takes a lot of discussion. And you know, kind of some people just don't want to do anything. I don't, I'm not trying to develop my property. And that's OK. And we'll keep there, you know, whatever. So we did a, a new uh, zoning ordinance for Route 1 in Yarmouth. And um, the first person who decided to do something following that zoning has built a building there now. And it kind of looks strange. It's pulled up in the street. Everything else is set back. It's like kind of a cool building or whatever. One day it's going to look really great as part of a streetscape right now because they're, you know, and, and the other people aren't doing anything yet. They're just hanging out and deciding what they want to do. They're watching and they're saying, wow, this guy's getting good rent, so his building's not going to do that too. So. Um, the second question was, uh, how do you keep from fracturing the town through a divisive process? Well, we um, we did recently a conference plan for Lewiston. And in Lewiston, um, you guys may have seen the news and all that, there was all the sort of friction between you know, people who've come there, refugees, etc., the locals, and people thought they were taking their jobs. 
job and all. So we come into this environment that's has historically been sort of very difficult and tricky, and national news kind of tricky, right? And so we go through our unemployment process. We, you know, people are meeting people they've never even met before. You know, those kind of things that are happening, and we're getting new people to come. And we're challenging people to bring new people with them to the process. And at the end of the day, it was a huge success. The plan was adopted. It took them a while. It took them a while to sort of massage it and get it to sell. Everybody was comfortable with it. You know, when you're when you're working in a, in a particularly um, uh, volatile environment, every word matters so much, yeah. and so you have to pick just the right word. That's not offend anyone. So, so they massaged it and they finally approved it. Well, just like I don't know, three or four weeks ago, it won Plan of the Year from the state of Maine. And so, um, uh, so maybe you know. I, I don't. I know you guys have part time with folks and stuff. We hear about it every time we talk to people, right? Um, but I, I don't actually have the, the sense that uh, you guys are sort of teetering on the edge of the abyss, like some communities we come to. You guys have your problems, just like everybody. But at the end of the day, you come together and you can sort of work it out. So hopefully, through a process like this, kind of shared vision, uh, gives you all something to rally around. It's something concrete. It's not just ideas. You can see things. So it's hard. So here it is. Yes. Who else? Yes. Uh, you did this magical Photoshop transition of the uh, you know, kill. And uh, it's quite dramatic. However, it would be interesting if you could show a few, uh, just a few, as you were saying, this doesn't have to be done in the next 10 years, right? There could be minimal changes to the existing parking lot of whatever relationship source that, that might achieve uh, a third or a half of what you're getting. So it would be interesting if you, know, you have this dramatic change. But, yes. Uh, well, here's where you can get Almost there. Yeah. Well, the one thing we do too, not to, to, to show getting almost there, but how do we even get there? Like, how do you accomplish a hundred year vision, right? And so we'll show like a phasing, a phased approach and say, here's phase one, and then you know, gas backwards or whatever. And you can, with Photoshop, I can take the rendering we have and I can just cut out all the pieces except for one. It's really kind of fun to see how that goes, especially when you flip through it on the slides. Like, it doesn't have quite the same impact in the minute document. But when you see it from here through, it's really neat. So yeah, we can kind of sort of getting real about it, being more realistic. It's like, oh, well, you know, what can we reasonably achieve in a relatively short amount of time? I think a good exercise. Yes. Uh, two questions. One is what now we've got fifty some odd square miles of Scarborough, and we're talking about seven. So what's the rest of the town look like? What, yeah. what do we look at for the rest? That's a great question. So um, one of the things that um, Matt talked about was um, kind of how we're dealing with the existing sort of suburban, residential, and commercial. And, you know, you see here we've been in a little bit cavalier with the commercial, um, but with the residential, we, we really use this sort of thing. We haven't known too many places where people are clamoring to have their uh, suburban neighborhood redeveloped. Like, right? They, say, <laughs> they might say, I really love that neighborhood over there, and I wish mine were like that, or, or whatever. But to get there is nearly impossible. Um, and so there are there's places where, as I mentioned, people want to maybe connect to three through a cul-de-sac or you know, whatever that's always been a cul-de-sac. Uh, and you guys, it's interesting, a lot of places we go, there are houses all the way around the cul-de-sac, which make it nearly impossible without threading a very tiny needle to get a road in there. You guys tend to sort of develop up and leave the end open as if you were thinking ahead about connecting. I don't know if it were, but it makes it easy. Um, and so generally what we do is we say that will just stay as it is. We sort of take it off the table. We're not looking to transform it, change it. It needs to kind of continue to get services. It needs to continue to be maintained. All of those kind of things. And until such point as, you know, the neighbors all get together and say, we'd like to transform our neighborhood. Or we're going to something as simple as, you know, we'd like to have sidewalks in our neighborhood. And here's how that works with the bigger picture sort of connectivity plan. Um, so that's really kind of helpful. Kind of tied to that. I mean, Running Hill Road is an example of. I'm a big believer in the trail system in the hub and spoke. I, I'd love to see that. I've been thinking about it for years. Is 
are you going to be looking at, for instance, Runny Hill Road is a very popular road, a lot of houses there. It would be great if that was a sidewalk, but I don't see how it's physically possible. Over the years, we've talked about it, and I, from a financial point of view, anything is possible, I But from a financial point of view, and the other question is, are you going to be looking at all, a lot of the planning board's done a great job as the community's been built out, uh, to have trails. And have you looked at connecting those trails? Yeah, so when you're looking sort of uh, town-wide and in a comprehensive land level, we tend to hit those kind of things at a higher level, you know, sort of we, you know, we count on the community to tell us, oh, we need a connection here, we can make those recommendations. But most likely the thing you'll see is something that says, you know, do a trails and connectivity master plan or whatever, or expand the one you have, or refer to the one you have, etc. And so, um, we, you know, that's a very specific thing we're talking about here. Um, but what we do, what we will do, is lay the, the foundation at, at a minimum of connectivity, connecting where we can, and that's sort of guiding the fact that you, you know, will look at it in, in greater detail. Because a lot of things that happen, um, a lot of further studies and, and different specific plans about topics in the comprehensive plan are spun off from a comprehensive plan. Yes.
we're going to have a full community engagement process around that as well before we bring it to our council for consideration. So I want folks to understand that you know we're still in the in the early stages of this process. If I called this the Super Bowl at the at sort of at the opening ceremony, we're maybe at the end of the first quarter at this point. So we still have quite a ways to go. So I just want to be sure that that point's clear for folks. So the question is, will the presentation be available? Um, I'm hopeful we're going to get these PowerPoints. I'm seeing nodding heads, so certainly. Uh, ScarboroughEngage.org is our website. Um, it's, it's a really uh, fantastic tool that we discovered. I've been working closely with Karen Martin um, to, to learn the tool and to continue to develop the tool. So we'll post the videos from um, all the videos that we have on the uh, program so far. Up, up there right now, I think we have just a link to our town website, but we're, we're getting more and more sophisticated every day, right, Karen? Right. Um, so, so scarboroughengage.org. Thank you for asking the question. So with that, um, I think we will close out Planet Palooza. You know, bring down the lights. <laughs>